welcome everybody. Um, welcome to our second Metrans uh, Transportation Center seminar of the fall semester. Um, this is our first October seven seminar. We have a triple header in October, so I hope you'll join all of them. Um, we are um, very pleased to have Professor um, Lucio Soibelman with us today. Um, I will introduce him in a moment, uh, but first um, I want to uh, give a minute to Carlo, um, who is a member of the student ITE group and would like to welcome us on behalf of ITE. So Carlo, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, thank you. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Carlo DiBernardo. I'm the president of USC Institute of Transportation Engineers. Um, and on behalf of our club, it is our pleasure to co-host uh, the wonderful Dr. Sogman uh, and his research presentation today. Uh, the USC Institute of Transportation Engineers is a student organization rooted in the interdisciplinary interests of the broad field of transportation. Uh, as a collective of undergraduate students, as well as graduate students, we dive deeper into the complexities of the everyday movement of humans and goods. Um, in our plight to explore the future of transportation, we look to support lectures like today. Um, we believe it is important to entertain infrastructure into a larger system, such as the Knowledge Network, which we'll uh, learn more about today. Uh, but we like to bring more students to events like this and uh, we're excited to hear the presentation today. And if you are interested in uh, transportation and you're an undergraduate or graduate students, feel free to check us out. Uh, we meet every Thursday at five. Um, and I'll give back the floor to Dr. Giuliano to introduce our speaker. Uh, thank, you. Thank, you very, thank you, Carlo. Very nice, very nice introduction. And um, I know that ITE is doing all sorts of uh, great things. Uh, now let me introduce our speaker. Um, I took a look at the uh, flyer, and the flyer says that uh, Professor Sobelman is a Dean's Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering uh, and the Spatial Sciences Institute. He's also the chair of the Sunni Astani Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Um, and it goes on to talk about his research interests. Um, I decided that's not a whole lot of information about Professor Sobelman, um, so I did a little scouting around, um, and it turns out that his PhD is from MIT. Um, he has taught at uh, the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, um, and he's taught at Carnegie Mellon, and for those of you who may or may not know, both of those schools are known for particularly strong civil engineering departments. Um, so um, he's had, um, he had quite an illustrious career before he came to USC uh, in 2012 to become the chair of the department. Um, what is also not in his bio, at least that I could found, find, is that he was recently, um, um, how do we call this? He, he has recently become a part of the National Academy of Construction. So um, that's uh, quite an honor for people who are working in the construction engineering field. Um, so um, congratulations on your latest um, honor. That's a wonderful one. Uh, so uh, now we're going to hear more about research that combines information technology and construction management uh, in large-scale engineering systems. And Professor Sobelman, I will turn it over to you. Um, I think we have about 45 minutes of presentation. Um, we have people, we've already asked people if they have questions to submit them into the Q&A um, so that um, we can forward them to you at the appropriate time. And I'll turn it over thank to you. Of course, thank you for inviting me, and uh, thank you for questions. And again, uh, always very happy that we have Metrans here in Southern California. Has been a huge support to my research. Jan has been a, an angel every time that I'm writing proposals, and uh, I need uh, some uh, support from Metrans. I had funding from Metrans uh, with Caltrans, so. Uh, 
uh, it's been a, a such important uh, uh, group and institution from uh, from USC that uh, it's one of the reasons that I'm here. Uh, second issue related to that, it's I decided to focus more the talk today in one of the work that I did together with Adam Rose to Metrans, okay, uh, uh, supported by Metrans. I think that it's more related to to what uh, the interest of this group. This is a grant that was funded by, uh, by NSF. It's a large group, uh, multi-million dollar grant from NSF. And I'm going to try to explain what I brought to that uh, group. And it's really the work that I've been doing uh, funded and supported by Metrans. So uh, what is my interest? Uh, I, I'm a data guy. I work with uh, uh, big data before big data was called big data. So uh, uh, for the term at the time was data mining and other issues. But I'm working with the whole life cycle of data. I'm working from uh, sensors to data acquisition to smart infrastructure, smart bridges, smart buildings, but using the, the data that come from those devices to better manage the infrastructure. What I tell is that I am the guy that love to do the research when people come to me and say, I'm drowning on data. I have all this data, but I cannot make smart and intelligent decisions because uh, I cannot use the data. I, I'm lost in that amount of data. So it's a, it's a very common statement that you are starving for knowledge, but you are drowning on data. And, uh, and so this is very related to what you have today. That's the fourth industrial revolution. So all these new technologies blurring the line of the physical and the digital world, uh, creating opportunities for to develop something that it's smart to continue state of awareness, the bridges that tell us how they're doing, that call us before they collapse, allowing us to be proactive and uh, manage this infrastructure and building in a different way that we do today. So one thing that it's really changing that I now we started all my meetings and presentation is the idea that you are in an inflection point. This data is creating inflection point. It's the first time in humanity that uh, you have machines for sense, agriculture, to the industrial revolution, to, to robotics in industry, uh, in assembly line, all those things, it's replacing humans in labor. Now, it's the time now that the computer and the intelligence is uh, replacing uh, our knowledge, our knowledge capability, our intelligence. So this is a big, big change. Uh, we see this all over, uh, driverless cars, advanced robotics, all those new sensors, GPS, gyroscopes, connectivity, and you are uh, creating a new knowledge uh, economy. So, uh, so you have machine interpreting medical images, legal research, finance, and etc. Many jobs are about to disappear, and uh, I think that we have to be very careful when we educate this new generation of engineers not to make sure that they are not obsolete. If you don't believe me, this is UBS trading floor in 2008. Okay. This is UBS trading floor in 2016. Okay. So all those jobs now for financial analysis, financial predictions, stock markets, analysis, everything now it's done by software, not by the hundreds of humans that had to eight to 16, 2008 to 16, already had all this impact in other industries. I strongly believe that this is going to be the same thing, civil engineering, transportation engineering, a lot of changes in this industry. So be prepared to a huge shift in the way that uh, we will be interacting with all of those systems in the very near future. So this is something that I recommend people to read. It's a book by uh, Joseph Aon. He was uh, the dean. He was the dean here in uh, 
in, at USC at Dornsife, he's now the president of Northeastern University. He just discussed about, uh, in a book called uh, Robot Proof uh, Education, and uh, he discussed about the idea of uh, 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 you have to teach and you have to learn to do things that the computers cannot do. So uh, it's a pretty interesting book. This, uh, he discussed a lot about systems thinking, entrepreneurship, cultural agility, and critical thinking. Things still that uh, we uh, can outperform computers. So this is very aligned to what I've been doing the last 20, 25 years because I've been using those same tools to help uh, be make better infrastructure decisions. And uh, I decided before I even enter in that research that it's the main reason for the presentation today is to talk about examples of things that I did in the past to, uh, to deal with people that are drawn on data. So this is... Uh, 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 for a company called uh, Red Zone Robotics, I uh, uh, started up from a professor from Carnegie Mellon, uh, uh, Red Whitaker, and uh, he developed this robot that is called the, the Responder. It's this robot in the left uh, uh, top, and it goes in sewer pipes. Okay, so what we have here in the right bottom is a GIS map of the city okay, with all the pipes that are not different than transportation uh, 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 lines, but it's uh, the pipeline system in the city. And he, the, uh, they send this robot in, the, in those pipes with the special cameras and LiDAR, and they, uh, they take pictures, they find the uh, cracks and problems in, the, in those pipes, and those uh, green circles are the facts. So basically, this company is selling the service to mayors, like the mayor of LA, and would say map of the city, where are the, uh, the sewer pipes that have problems, you'd put a click in any of those circles and you'd see images of those defects. Okay? People doing similar systems for pavements and other things. The problem is that you have uh, a uh, 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 trailer, that uh, having the top it, you have the trailer, and an operator driving with a joystick, driving that robot, looking at the images and finding the defect. This was done by humans. The, finding the defect, geocoding the defect into the map, a link picture of the defect, those uh, circles, and classifying the defect according to an ontology of called uh, PACP. It's a uh, pipeline assessment certification for for that go uh, trained to 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 classify those defects then they would play a structural defect that a crack that can be a crack that is a structural defect. so again so humans would go and, and and present these uh these defects and everything so what happened is that the the company developed this one robot that's called the solo okay and the solo is a, a, a robot that the other one, the responder, was a $2 million robot. This is a $10,000 robot. So this is autonomous. There is no one driving this robot. You put in the solar pipe, and this thing drives itself for, uh, for uh, eight hours, I think, seven hours. It's the battery and the hard drive with the images, the capability, but it drives itself acquire the images. And so cities like LA bought 10 of those robots. So in the end of the day, they would have 80 hours of video coming from those robots. So now who is going to classify the guy that was in the trailer? Now can go in the office and watch the, visual, the videos, but now you have 80 hours of video being produced a day. So, uh, so you don't have, you need to have eight, nine, 10, uh, inspectors looking at those videos and doing the classification. It's obvious that they were drowning on data. They couldn't keep doing this manually. So this is when they came, as I said before, I like to work with people that are drowning on data. And we went and did the whole uh, classification system uh, for the uh, automated this process. And uh, popular science considered this research to be one of the 25 new technologies transform our crumbling infrastructure. Uh, other example of people drowning on data 
is uh, is uh, this is the uh, interface of transportation and energy. So this was right after uh, the right after the the Hurricane Katrina uh, uh, in uh, in uh, New Orleans. So uh, uh, the the President uh, Bush at the time was visiting uh, uh, New Orleans with the Secretary of Energy. And they were visiting the port of New Orleans that was completely destroyed. And they were informed that the port was going to be out of operation with being maintenance and reconstruction for at least six months. And the Secretary of Energy looked at his staff and asked, uh, how are we going to work uh, with energy in Florida? At the time, 80% of energy produced in Florida used coal that would come from Wyoming. The coal would come by rail to the Mississippi River, barge down the Mississippi River to New Orleans and back to rail to Florida. You close the port, you don't have way to transport the coal to, to Florida. And it's not that easy. You, you guys are from transportation. It's not that easy to get tons and tons of, of, of coal and change to another line, to another uh, way of transportation because uh, 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 you don't have that buffer that you can just say, okay, let's, uh, let's uh, find another transportation uh, uh, company or another railroad company, another way to move it. So, so the idea is that they really didn't know the interconnection of the transportation and the energy uh, 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 grid. Uh, so what would happen when a bridge collapses? How it does affect energy production in the U.S.? And they 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 uh, they uh, had this group in West Virginia. The Department of Energy had a group at NETL, National Engineer Engineering Technology Lab, National Energy Technology Lab, in West Virginia. That was what they called the risk and uh, extreme events group. So every time that a hurricane would be uh, 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 reaching the United States, they would, uh, the Miami Hurricane Center would call this group in West Virginia and would tell them, look, this hurricane's approaching, how this is going to affect either the coal transportation in the US or, uh, or the, the energy production, power plants, uh, the grid or other things. So those guys had to do this analysis and to tell they would receive the, the path, the expected path of the hurricane. And then they would have uh, uh, more than 50 different databases. The data was coming from the grid operators, from power plants, from mine companies, from, uh, from the, uh, the core of engineers with uh, dams and locks, from, uh, from uh, uh, the companies that would barge coal, the, co the railroad companies, all private companies with their own databases. So those guys had to go to all those databases to see, uh, to try to predict the impact of that uh, uh, hurricane. And uh, it would take them to do the analysis around uh, three to four days. The problem is that the hurricane center in Miami would update the position of the hurricane every two hours. So they would start their analysis and now the hurricane would go 50 miles to the north. So the whole analysis would start over again. And those guys would never answer any question because they are just drowning on data. So this is exactly when we got this grant to create a data warehouse that integrate all those databases, those more than 60 databases. And then you went and you go, in this case is an example for a mine. If you have uh, the mine are the square, so you have one, one mine and you click that mine, that mine collapsed, you start popping up power plants. I don't have 90% of my coal, I don't have 70% of my coal. We did the same thing for, for every railroad system. So uh, you can click at any bridge in the railroad and say this bridge collapsed, you know exactly the impact on energy production and energy distribution uh, because of the coal transportation. Uh, obvious that this was a very interesting research. As soon as you showed it, uh, DOE got in panic because this data in the wrong hands, and now comes all the issues of privacy, security. Uh, terrorists would love to know which bridge would have the biggest impact to blow. 
So they basically never allowed me to publish, at least with the railroad, you're seeing here why I have this for the, for the mines, but not for the railroads, because we cannot show the vulnerability of the system. So now comes to this research that I've been working with NSF and a group of, of, of colleagues all over the United States. And this is basically the, the, the limit of being on drowning on data and data with different uh, 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 type uh, uh, sources and formats. So what happened is that uh, uh, you have bridges, as I said before, smart bridges that have sensors. We have uh, uh, inspection on bridges that uh, uh, bridges have to be inspected uh, 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 and then uh, people go and they fill a text document. So, uh, so it's, uh, telling about cracks on the bridge. The bridge. So you've got this uh, accelerator. It's really to converge from areas. It's a very important national problem. And this is uh, what you call the uh, CIS, OKN. It's the Civil Infrastructure System Open Knowledge Network. And open knowledge is, is basically a big data base, a data warehouse that keeps all the data coming up about bridge, about uh, creation models, creating a, 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 an economic analysis. And this is what I'm going to discuss now. So about the group, uh, it's to understand and, uh, the pain point needs and perspectives of all Department of Transportation. And, and, and uh, we've been working with Caltrans. Metrans supported us in, in, the, in this work. We have people from Purdue, from USC, from Illinois, from, uh, from uh, Virginia Tech, from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, uh, and you have several departments of transportation that are providing us uh, data. And what we are trying, you have case, uh, cases that you try to merge the data. Oh, and by the way, in the previous slide, I didn't say you had computer scientists, you have sociologists, you have urban planners, you have transportation people, you have uh, 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 bridge engineers, you have uh, 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 everyone that was working their own silos and creating their data, putting that data together that you can integrate the data in a way that allow us to do what you call some kind of analytics and predictions. And the examples would be, for example, uh, create deterioration models okay, for, 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 for bridges that are merging the data from drones, from images, from pictures, from uh, sensors, from uh, text reports and all those different sources. We have a group that is looking into safety and socioeconomic impact analysis. So uh, safety, accessibility, economic affected by the conditions and what are the consequences of failure. And, uh, and uh, an example that I've been working with called Trans in Operation and Maintenance Decision Support. Uh, uh, so, so my idea here, the analogy that I use here is uh, when you see a hurricane, to have an example now with us, but uh, when you hit, see an extreme event and you look at the newspapers and you see the cost of the event, hurricane in Florida, the cost is, they calculate the cost of the hardware destroyed. They calculate the cost of the, of the, uh, uh, of the bridges that collapse, they are all calculating the replacing, the replacement cost. And in reality, the cost, this is just the tip of the iceberg. What about uh, if I take one year to rebuild that? We're going to be uh, traveling uh, distant, have more time, cost uh, is stuck on traffic, but there is a Walmart down the street that people won't be able to reach. So uh, if they cannot reach the Walmart, so that Walmart is going to fire all the employees and those people, uh, then you have less money in a local economy having economic problems and how you calculate this economic domino uh, impact. Normally, this is not presented. And the same thing, and then with the social example, it's even uh, about access to hospitals, access to schools, to, to, to parks, and every, that you cannot even give a dollar value to that, but uh, 
that you have to understand the impact. Normally, Department of Transportation don't do this analysis of the vulnerability of their systems. Uh, in the example of the maintenance that I'm talking, the last bullet here, we worked with Caltrans in an example that they, uh, they have a bridge that they have to do maintenance. They have many options for maintenance construction in the bridge. One of the options was to close the bridge for one week in all directions, and, uh, and this is engineering was the cheapest one. Last time for, uh, for uh, renting the crane, last time of, uh, of uh, management, last time of people. So, so this was the cheapest option was the one, close everything, fix the bridge in seven days. And then there was a much more expensive because you take three times more uh, uh, option of, uh, of closing partially the bridge and moving the traffic to the other side of the bridge and keeping it partially open. Uh, there is extra cost for safety and other issues. So Caltrans decided the cheapest one that was the engineering cheapest solution. But when we started doing the analysis with Adam Rose and colleagues from Price and School of uh, with a background in economics done way, we were able to prove that the cheapest uh, solution, engineering solution, would have such a domino effect in the economy that uh, was much smarter for them to do the more expensive engineering solution would have a much, much slow, smaller impact in the society. But in a way that it's quantified, it's not just the feeling of traffic jams and all those things, but that they could go to a town hall meeting with the city and convince residents that they are making a decision that it's the one that has the last impact for them. So. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, we are working in putting all this data together, integrating text, images, uh, beam data, sensor data. Uh, we are working with uh, uh, what you call urban resilience challenge. Uh, so, uh, so I'm going to have more slides uh, discussing this, the resilience. And, uh, so, uh, so this is more, I, I'm going to have to run because it's 12.30, so uh, to, to go faster. I'm going to leave 15 minutes for discussion. But the idea is that uh, this is the work Adam Rose and colleagues from UCLA and uh, uh, into integrating structural, uh, integ integrating structural analysis and the economic side and the transportation, integrating those different models to try to do that economic analysis uh, with uh, from uh, from an earthquake. So I'm going to present a case. So uh, I'm not going to discuss what vulnerability and resilience; those are terms, but uh, in working a lot. Uh, trying to have measure of uh, resilience into the into the system. Uh, I'm thinking that I'm going more to the case study, but again, there are all those definitions about reliability, uh, resilience, vulnerability, and you want to have some measures because they had the economic impact. Today, it's very difficult to talk to a man or to some Caltrans, which bridge they should uh, enforce or, 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 or be prepared for the big earthquake and uh, for them to know if the investment is worth or not of retrofitting those uh, infrastructure systems. They really need to understand what would be the impact of not doing it. So this is what we are trying to help them in the system. So, uh, so obviously that uh, uh, we have the topo topology-based systems. Uh, for that you use graph theory and uh, what what called the systems based uh, that uh, we have travel demand and supply models and so those are basically uh, 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 the, what used for those uh, system based vulnerability approaches so uh, we, we we focused in the system based despite the ex uh, the very large amount of data and modeling requirements, the, with the system approach provided us the opportunity to capture the realities of transportation disruptions holistically, keeping uh, desired granularity to an entire 
operation across the distance that we say that it disaster with different silos, as I said before, helping us uh, to do the better uh, help support decision makers. So, uh, so uh, we worked uh, uh, the transportation analysis. So uh, uh, it was more uh, the data driven one that I worked with this PhD student. Then you have the hazard car car characterization and damage assessment. Uh, so uh, uh, this was a co collaboration with uh, a, a, a professor, a colleague from UCLA, and the economic impact analysis that you did in collaboration here with Price, with the way and uh, Adam Rose. So uh, we developed a consistent methodology that uh, investigates resilience across different networks versions and hazard scenarios and investigate the post-disaster demand supply uh, relationships. The, from the hazard groups, we integrated uh, hazard characterization and damage assessment, uh, pro procedures with transportation network analysis. We basically, uh, uh, you, it's, it's going to show some examples. They, they use the existing pictures from bridges and they rebuild the structural models of those bridges in place of using simplified approaches of uh, uh, damage assessment done from hazard uh, softwares and other things that it's normally used. And uh, in the economic side would uh, look at, at those uh, economic models uh, that uh, input output models and other models to use to try to understand the impact on the economy. So uh, we did uh, this whole uh, framework that we developed from uh, finding the hazards, occurrence, we calculate the loads, we extracted bridge geometry, we model bridge and simulate the, the, the hazard response for this case on Earth. We created what it's called the fragility functions. We estimate the functionality loss, if the bridge is going to be closed and how long it's going to rebuild the bridge. And then we uh, implemented these failures, those bridges collapsed or those bridges would take three months to be rebuilt. And then you went uh, and impacted our model network versions. Uh, and then uh, we uh, did all the trip generations, trip distribution, assignments, time of the day. We look at the choice of mode choice, and then we are able to use that in the functionality indicators. So here is the the, the value study that we do. This is what I said. This came from our collaborators in in uh, in, uh, in Caltrans, uh, not at uh, at uh, UCLA. So basically, they have hundreds of pictures of bridges that exist from Google Earth, Google Maps. Uh, they, uh, some they flew drones, some they, uh, they use uh, several uh, uh, existing models that already were called trends, and they really create what we call those uh, fragility models from, uh, from the bridge. So you are able then uh, uh, to create this uh, earthquake in 7.3 magnitude that you use it to run the scenario. But then we you use it, uh, TransCAD. To, it's a software from, uh, from Caliper Corporation that uh, you validated with a lot, large number of independent source of data from truck traffic counts, transit boarding counts, uh, vehicle miles travel, from highway performance monitoring system, speed data from freeway performance measurements, uh, uh, and other survey data. Uh, and uh, it basically includes 21,000 central line miles of, uh, of freeways, arterials, and even uh, major urban collectors. Uh, and the model highway granularity and accommodates a holistic transportation network, enabling a wide range of analysis, including investigation and expansion projects, highway pricing, uh, and, and, and uh, other possible analysis. So this is, uh, 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 and then, then we went to basically this uh, uh, what we call the resilience analysis for the bridges you have this uh, the functionality 100% and you have the 
the the earthquake and the day one of the earthquake you lose you let's say that you lose 75 percent of functionality and then you start uh, increasing and improving the, the network and the, fixing the bridges until you go back to your uh, functionality at, at the day t, t0 plus tn so uh, so here it's when you went and uh, run the, the CG models from the economics. So already discussed about the two uh, left uh, uh, squares of the of the framework, and then uh, having that uh, the network resilience, you are able to run the uh, the CG models for economic, and you are able to come up with the real cost of that failure. So here, yeah, the 7.3 magnitude earthquake, in the Palos Verdes fault. Uh, we uh, uh, run the earthquake, and then you had the characteristics, and those circles are bridge closures from one to seven days, seven to thirty days. Here in the top right, you could see the 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 analysis of all those uh, 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 impacts on all those bridges. Uh, and then uh, here you have the bridges that use the UCLA method and the ones that are in yellow use the Hazus inventory because they didn't have models for those bridges. And then you are able to find the, the change in, in, in for a change of vehicle flow uh, for, for, uh, for the whole transportation network. Uh, my old two uh, changes, uh, you are able to go to look at the 147 bridges. We had 860,000 additional hours a day spent on traffic, 690,000 hours a day additional delay in LA County. Uh, 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 so uh, 730,000 in delay study region. So with those numbers, you are able to uh, go to the economic model, uh, uh, to the CG model, and start looking at the impact in the whole economy. Uh, we had, uh, 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 we did, uh, we, Adam and Wei worked a lot for the port of LA, trying to look at day one, day three, day seven, day 14, what was the, 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 the loss of functionality for cargo, for cargo type, and then uh, transforming that the port disruption in uh, uh, in uh, in flows and and everything else that you are able to do uh, import price export quantity and all variables and then they were able to get uh, uh, the GDP impact okay both from the port and from the transportation and. Uh, uh, and the cost impacting the whole region. So the issue here is, uh, uh, in reality, how you bridge those silos, and this is our interest. You get the people that are looking at earthquake and impact on bridges, the people in transportation and people in economics. So my really curiosity is that these all data-driven issues, they're all looking at some examples that prove the concept, but uh, we really wanted to go beyond the concept and try to go in the real world model and trying to understand what the limitations are and what the difficulties to do this and creating the interface for those siloses. I am here at USC. You guys are all welcome to, to come and I, I can go deeper and explain a little bit better uh, if you want to call me later and you can continue this discussion. So first of all, I'm going to say some virtual applause is in order for an extremely interesting and um, very comprehensive presentation. And uh, while I, I'll give um, our, our uh, participants and our attendees a little bit of time um, to consider a question or two, uh, one of the things that <clears throat> people outside of the engineering field may not know um, is how important bridges are um, because you know the sort of person in the street when we say bridge we think of a bridge across water or something uh, but in fact uh, the transportation system has bridges everywhere uh, do you want to talk a little bit about um, 
how important bridges are in the system. I mean, perhaps people didn't, you know, if you go back to your slide uh, that showed the number of bridges down in your simulation, um, there were a large number and those were just simply overpasses or yeah. things like that, right? Yes, uh, that's a good point. So if you go to the first present the presentation about the electricity work, okay, the, the interface of uh, the grid and the transportation, uh, there was one bridge over the Mississippi River, a railroad bridge, that if that bridge collapses, we would have 180 million Americans without electricity. Okay. You'd not be able to get coal in the East Coast mm -hmm. for 180 million Americans. So, so the first thing that they did with that research is to build a second bridge. Okay, so so they realized that the the uh, maintaining and keeping, but if anything happened with the bridge, they needed to have redundancy. The system had zero redundancy in that area. So they created uh, the first thing that the DOE went went to to the part to the Department of Transportation and then start talking about uh, some redundancy in the system that they never realized that the system was so uh, 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 so, so uh, such being used at the limit without any redundancy at all. Right, so vulnerable. Yeah, so extremely vulnerable. And, uh, and uh, we are not maintaining well our bridges. Our bridges are in very, very bad shape. Uh, yeah, here is what almost 200 bridges that were affected in this earthquake in LA. And one thing that I talk, and we talk about the economic, but my interest, it's not just an economic. As soon as, it's not that people are not going to be able to go from point A to B, because they would go down from the freeways to surface streets and they would uh, still be able to reach point B, but taking extra time and this extra time cost money. But more important than all is that we are realizing that it has a huge social impact because majority of those roads pass through the lowest income neighborhoods. So you would increase the, the, the flow of trucks and heavy movement in those lower income neighborhoods and with a huge impact in the environment. Mm -hmm. Because as soon as you remove the trucks from the freeway and they are and they stop and go uh, mode in the uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, surface streets, the level of the pollution that they generate, it's not linear. It's, it's really exponential compared to what they do in the freeway. So all these would bring to these lower income uh, 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 neighborhoods. So we have a lot of interest of going beyond dollar and presenting all those social and economic and environmental impact of, uh, of the failure of those bridges. So did anybody have a question? You have them overwhelmed. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't know in what level of, of uh, technical discussion. I, I didn't know exactly my well, audience. If I would show, go, I try to avoid equations and everything, but uh, I try to, to, to present the objectives. That's exactly, uh, we have too much data. This data that you have in the Department of Transportation that you have uh, today or SCAG has uh, the amount of data that they have. And I, we could not even run with our supercomputers. You needed bigger supercomputers to create those models. Okay? So they are really drowning on data and we need more students that, uh, I would say that the current generation of transportation engineers that are running those for those systems, they, 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 they are being overwhelmed by the data and they don't have the background. So there is a whole new profession uh, in this area of people that understand transportation, but understand data and would be able to mm -hmm. crunch the data and help them in doing their decision. They have the data, but they're still doing the decision about the enge lower engineering costs because they cannot really calculate what's the impact of their decision in the society, even if they have the data. Yes, and um, unfortunately, there's also uh, situations where the data is so overwhelming, they throw it away. Oh. You know? <laughs> or, or they get the wrong data you know, at all. We have, it costs us to store it. We don't know what to do with it. 
so we throw it away. So we, we have three questions here. Uh, yes, we uh, do. Asset management. Um, the question is, can your system that you've developed be used for asset management for state DOTs? It's what you want. So this is why you are working with Caltrans. It's funny because when you created this first prototype in this research uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to NSF and been working and, uh, and I went to Caltrans to talk to them and I presented it at District 7 uh, and was pretty interesting to see how excited he was because he, he was smiling years to years said, yes, this is what you want. But they're doing an amazing job. They already have a very good data group. So they are in the right direction. Uh, I think that there is good collaboration. So we did learn a lot with them. Wasn't the, so uh, they did allow our students, they did open their system to us. It's very rare, no other DOT did for any of my colleagues in the team in the other DOTs, uh, the District 7 here opened their doors and said, this is what you are, have. And uh, they have a lot of interesting things going on. They do uh, have a mandate, internal mandate to, to better use their data. So uh, I, we are very excited that uh, I, I think that uh, we will, uh, this is just the starting. I think that you together, you are going to, to be able to, to do something interesting. They have good people there. Yes, we'd like to hear that. <laughs> they like to hear that too. Um, another question actually that I have is um, you mentioned the, the, the security risk related to the data itself. Uh, the fact that the terrorists would like to know how many bridges would go down to. Yeah. Did you come up with a solution for that? That's a, a big discussion. So this is the NCSA collaborators from, NS, from this grant of NSF. Uh, they are from uh, NCSA, National Center for Supercomputer in Illinois, that they are looking into that. We have uh, uh, this data that you're receiving from all those departments of transportation and this big data center. You are creating something called, uh, they are creating something called a Clouder. And it's a very safe access to data. Uh, but again, uh, the data that we are putting together for this knowledge network, we can guarantee safety. But a lot of that data that you are getting, it's available free out there. So others would be able to grasp, grab the same amount of data that we put together, and they would be able to replicate a lot of those things uh, and uh, find a lot of vulnerability in our systems. So this data in the wrong hands can be extremely dangerous. Right. We have a couple of questions here. Uh, one says, how can I know more about this if I see some room for collaboration? I'm a PhD student. Send me an email, let's have a Zoom conversation. I can get my PhD students talking to you. Uh, I'm all about collaboration. I think that this, this, this presentation is showing that I, 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 I like to break silences. I really like to, to work across those groups and put people together. As, as you saw in my presentation, very little was me, me, was uh, him, uh, UCLA team, the, 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 the prize team, and uh, we, uh, my job is try to put those pieces of the puzzle together. So. Uh, this is exactly what I'm giving this talk, to find what's out there and to find collaboration. Wonderful. Uh, so the student, send that, send that email. Um, here's a transportation question. Uh, for the hypothetical failure of a bridge, how do you determine the alternative routes of trucks and how does that fit into your analysis? So this is, uh, this is uh, done with uh, uh, SCAG models. Uh, so uh, this is basically the existing transportation models that uh, Caltrans and others are using in the region. You are using the same type of models. For just to kind of elaborate on that, um, SCAG is responsible for all of the transportation planning in the region. 
And so they have, over the years, developed very sophisticated network um, and transportation uh, demand forecasting models. Uh, they're one of the few um, places uh, that has also a truck model that's incorporated in their transportation model. Um, most metropolitan areas do not have that. Um, and so um, if you are familiar with models at all, uh, what TransCAD will do is uh, they will load after you have perturbed the network by making the bridge come down, uh, they will then load, reload all the traffic based on origins and destinations. Yeah. Um, and they uh, will then load the, um, the truck demand on top of the passenger car demand. And that's how they do it. Yeah, so basically we are using those. And you know, the beauty is that uh, talking about that, I haven't had that experience before with people to be so open. Uh, I think that everyone is looking to 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 find uses for that data. Yeah. So uh, so Skag is much more concerned with planning, defining should we build a new highway, should we uh, uh, widen this part of the highway, should we uh, uh, replace that bridge. So they are really not using their data for uh, for uh, extreme events analysis. So when you arrive there, they just saw us as a resource to do something that they don't have the bandwidth to do it. So this is very unique. Uh, not, normally, those organizations would protect their data and say no. So they basically gave an office for my PhD students. And my PhD students moved to their office and uh, was there and uh, they found the computer, the supercomputer access to us. And they even gave one of their staff to help my student to run our models. So, uh, and the same thing with District 7, I think that people are really, as I said before, drowning on data and starving for knowledge. Wherever you come and you discuss, let's work together, everyone wants uh, and, and, and and it's, it's an environment that myself as a researcher, I haven't seen in the past. I think that something is changing today that people are much more willing to collaborate and to find solutions and to understand that no one alone would be able to solve that complex problem. We had a note in the, in the, uh, in the chat box that Jeff Newman from District 7 is here. My He's friend, here. Jeff. Pleasure working Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Jeff. It's been a, 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 a light for us into uh, finding us the right people. Again, uh, I would say that finding the right people that help us uh, is Jeff's work. Yes, and uh, I have to say, um, all of the local agencies have been great um, for. Metrans and Metrans researchers, no matter what the topic is. Um, we've worked with SCAG for years, um, using their models for all kinds of analysis and all kinds of things. So um, most recently on a question of um, uh, getting of zero emission trucks. Oh, just one thing to, to the, the only bad news of all this. We got this grant from uh, was $1.2 million from NSF to work for a year to start building the prototype. Uh, we did it and, and now one this year, month. You said? Yeah, one year. Wow. They basically gave us money to, to write a proposal. And this is what we did for one year. We, uh, we worked with Jeff and Caltrans, understanding the problem and with SCAG and, uh, uh, and uh, with the support from Metrans. And uh, we, together with those group from Illinois and others, uh, and we built a small <clears throat> prototype. And now you are writing proposals to, to fund us for this to deliver it. It's still, it's, a, it's, a, it's it. just a prototype with not with the whole, we proved the concept, but now we need to go to implementation. 
uh, we wrote a proposal that was unsuccessful, but now you are still writing, you are writing an ERC, an engineering research center. This would be a, a $15 million uh, grant to keep this group working. So we've, we've been, but I think that we have the preliminary results prove the concept to be powerful. And I think that sooner or later, you're going to get the funding to continue yeah, the work. Sounds like it. Wonderful. Okay. Well, I don't hear any more questions. Uh, I don't see any more questions, I should say. So let me thank you again for a very uh, good uh, presentation. It'll be available and we'll have it, um, you know, we'll be advertising that or marketing it on our website. So thank you, Lucio, again. Very good. Um, and you. you've You've done a great job launching our um, our October triple header. Thank you. Thank and, you, everybody. Uh, thank you for all the support that we get from Metrans. It's it's a very important for us. Well, when it comes when it produces things, we're always happy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everybody.